Beleza. Afternoon. 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 Everyone. Okay, um, welcome to those who have joined us today for the public session uh, of our board. A reminder to those of our board members who are on Zoom uh, to stay muted uh, uh, as and when you can put your hand up and we'll bring you in. Good afternoon to everyone and welcome to this first accountability session for 2022. Uh, welcome to our new appointments. It's been a busy number of weeks since we last met with the board progressing and confirming four new appointments to uh, the chief's leadership team. Uh, and the last position of ACO people and organizational development has now been advertised. So very shortly, we will have the full senior team uh, in place. One point away, from, uh, one appointment away, I should say, from completion of uh, structure. Uh, and whilst we're undoubtedly pleased with the appointments made as a board, we're deeply concerned that there were no female applicants for the ACC positions. This is something I know, Chief, that we have already spoken about, uh, but diversity representativeness at all levels of the organisation is essential. And whilst there's been a range of positive actions over the last number of years, more needs to be done to increase diversity in the pool of applicants for future positions. There have been positive moves uh, on the staff side of the house um, uh, in terms of both male and female appointments, but on the officer side, that was the one disappointment that was there. And um, over the course of December and through January, uh, I, along with the, the vice chair and the chair of resources committee, have had a series of meetings and discussions with uh, you and your team, also with the Department of Justice and indeed with the chair of the Justice Committee on the outworking of the proposed budgetary settlement. We're some way short of what is needed. We know the financial pressures faced in our health service and across the public sector as a whole pressures which are not assisted by the rising cost of living across society. We also know that the funding gap can't currently be bridged without reducing headcount. And there will be questions in relation to that uh, later on in the meeting. We've discussed at length the consequences of reducing numbers, but also how budget pressures on other parts of the public sector will likely have a knock-on effect on demand on policing. So to include as a board, we support your position of protecting the establishment levels that we have uh, but also being pragmatic at this time with a slightly longer term ambition of reaching the 7,500 officers. We also know the funding streams are complex, so there may be an opportunity to provide some clarity around this as well. In your report today, um, Chief Constable updates are provided on a range of operations to improve safety and the numbers of calls taken, which are the everyday real life, real time calls for policing help. Just before Christmas, we were updated on the PSNI plans in response to violence against women and girls. The murder of Ashley Murphy sent shockwaves across the community and refocused attention on actions and community assurances needed. So it's welcome that the executive has published a consultation on a new domestic and sexual uh, abuse and violence against women and girls strategy. Also welcome to read the updates in your report around advocacy measures in place to support victims and that training has been rolled out to officers so that they understand new legislation that will criminalize abusive behavior. On spit and bite guards, uh, which is a subject of significant debate and scrutiny over the last two years by the board and the members of the performance committee. Um, today, the board have agreed that the continued use of spit and bite guards by the uh, chief constable will be subject to an agreed frame, governance framework that will be reviewed on a regular basis. And I will be writing to you with the specifics around all of that um, uh, after this meeting. Um, the report also uh, had a, uh, we also received a report from the Human Rights Advisor, and I thank John Wadham um, for the work that he's done on that, highlighting the key elements that will need to be taken into account and developing a drafting a, and drafting a governance framework. These specifically, but not exclusively, include the use on children and vulnerable people, the possibility of greater opportunities for de-escalation, the use once a subject has already been restrained, and officer training and differences in use in relation to community background. So to be clear, the board position is very much subject to this oversight framework being developed uh, and agreed. And finally, before I give you the opportunity to speak, um, step forward this week in terms of the new 
rollout of practical uniforms for officers. Uh, things don't always move quickly, but the slow boat has arrived with the uniforms uh, on board. Uh, so well done to all involved from that, and they do look well. And Finn, who is in the background of our meeting, has assured me they're very comfortable as well. So uh, well done for that. So uh, we have lots of questions to cover today, Chief, but before we move to those, uh, just if you could highlight some of the things from your report, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and uh, for both the support in the budgetary situation and for some of those updates. Um, I think the main thing to sort of signal today at the start of the meeting, and obviously there's a, a broad perspective of issues, both within uh, Northern Ireland and policing in general at the moment, uh, that we may touch on this morning, is our continued concern about the precarious budgetary situation we find ourselves in. So we still have a, a, a budgetary gap at the moment of 226 million over the next three years, which is effective to take in an organisation the size of my previous police service out of the PSNI and expecting the same levels of service. Um, we have taken some short term measures, as we reported recently, in deferring a, a recruitment uh, intake, but clearly if not addressed, we will have to make some tough choices and prudent decisions around the future type of policing service the public can expect to see. Clearly, we will continue to answer 999 calls, police our streets and deliver neighbourhood policing, but without adjustment, inevitably over time, things will be different. To try and put it into context, this is the equivalent of losing one officer a day, every day for the next three years. So it'll be a trickle at the start and a tidal wave at the end if we don't address this. Clearly and quite rightly, you will ask uh, myself and particularly Pamela and the senior team to come up with methods to try and ameliorate this. But where we face issues at the moment, even if we look at other lines of the budget in terms of contracts and non-pay savings, we are not confident we can balance next year or beyond that in the current settlement given very well sort of rehearsed pressures around pay inflation and some of the must-do commitments that we have as a police service. Clearly, like yourself, Chair, we've been actively engaged in stakeholder meetings to try and ameliorate some of the pressures. As things stand currently, we're not particularly optimistic that this is going to be addressed and therefore these tough choices will have to be made both in the next few weeks and in the months ahead. On a more optimistic note, and you signalled uh, yourself before, the report does touch on some elements of modernisation. Um, the uniform has gone out uh, on time on Monday, and I think all the feedback I have had has been really well received as practical fit for purpose work where as have the rollout of the new tough books, which I think over time will be a game changer, both for the relationship with the public, how we manage calls, capture evidence and give feedback, but equally the relationship between the patrolling officer and their time spent out in the field. And there's some examples in the report about the benefits we've seen already in that space. Clearly, a matter of concern that has arisen since our last meeting has been the non-processing of fixed penalty notices in our centre in Lishnashara. And I know John Roberts will be able to update in more detail uh, today, if needs be. It is clearly regrettable. It was an issue when we've looked at this of part a failing of resourcing, partly issues around system and process, also about how we gain assurance and also contract management. So these are all lessons that we are trying to pick up at the moment, factually, before we uh, can come back to the board with a, a clear plan for remedy. Uh, there'll be things Pamela's doing around the use of internal audit to give us that absolute assurance that this won't happen again, and clearly conversations with third parties as well. Uh, on the horizon, we are dealing with a range of issues at the moment. Clearly, policing uh, the consequences of um, EU exit remain a concern for us. There is continued uncertainty in the legacy position and doubtless today there may be some questions and commentary about both recent and forthcoming ombudsman reports. I think it's important also to recognise uh, some of the efforts in the last month the report touches on Neighbourhood Policing Week where we'll see some pretty impressive figures about reach of social media insight to what neighbourhood policing officers have been doing across the country, over two million uh, reaches in that space on some of our platforms which again is credit to local policing teams and the drive from Alan and others to, to, to showcase in a sort of very transparent way what we've been doing in that space, which I know, apart from being a personal priority, is really important to the policing board. Clearly, in relation to other issues, um, 
The focus on policing in the UK remains unabated. There's been numerous headlines in the last few days about behaviour and conduct elsewhere. It's an issue that particularly Mark has been exercised on, and he'll be able to brief later if needs be, on what we're seeing is changing patterns of behaviour and sanctions within the organisation in the light of sort of the focus to address sexual misuse of power in the workplace, uh, crimes in the workplace, and, and so on and so forth, so that we'll be able to give you some assurance there about what we're doing. And then finally, I think, Chair, again, in terms of a signal to the future, we share the, um, the importance of building a team that is diverse, both in terms of our gender and ethnicity and so on and so forth, as well as skills and experience. It's really good to welcome two new senior appointments uh, to the Assistant Chief Constable role that you touched upon. Um, and equally, in terms of some optimism for the future, recent recruitment rounds at the next tier down, Chief Superintendent and Superintendent, I've seen broadly 50-50 splits in the successful candidates. So largely for our next generation, it helps us look at talent management, coaching and support for people to help them to step up and obviously Mark himself was only recently back from a director role in the senior command course where we should be able to share some of that learning experience to try and make that difference. Although inevitably, if our budgetary situation remains unchanged, the trickle of recruitment that we'll be able to afford will inevitably have a consequence in the medium term for how representative we will continue to be in the round. And I'll sort of pause there, Chair. Thank you for that, Chief Constable. Um, we will continue to support you in making the uh, uh, the case around the budget and, and stressing the need for additional resources to uh, uh, to be leveraged. Uh, uh, that, that I give you the assurance, and that indeed was was agreed by the board today. So we're going to start with looking at uh, a question around neighbourhood policing effectiveness, and it comes from Michael Atkinson. Michael, hi, uh, and welcome, Chief Constable. Um, Yes, yeah, so I wanted just to touch on the, the your recent report to board um, plays out some of the more positive work that's happening at a, a neighbourhood policing level and notwithstanding some of the budgetary issues that are going on, uh, I just wanted to reflect a wee bit of background context and then a question for you here. So we, we've had those sort of positive reports uh, coming back fr from yourselves. We've had some very positive feedback on South Armands and some of the work that's been going on there to implement the actions from that review. And it's clear that the PSNI does attach considerable importance uh, to building strong and productive relationships in the local community uh, through the increasing levels of NPTs and in addressing issues, for example, domestic abuse and the victims of internet crime. Uh, we have a new report format that was rolled out with local commanders in just December past, maybe still in an embryonic stage, but to enable more effective reporting at the, the local uh, PCSP policing committees. And also work has progressed through a working group which comprised uh, board members and also the PSNI senior team to establish local survey arrangements which link into outcome three of the policing plan engaged in support of communities. So the question really is, uh, might, might the Chief Constable update us on how confident he is in the arrangements now being put in place uh, to help improve police effectiveness at a local level and also the measures that are being put in place to establish good baseline reference points from which to assess PSNI performance as we move forward. Thanks, Michael. And, and a lot that sits underneath what is one of our key priorities, as, as I said at the start. Um, I think it's probably seeing this as certain phases. So in a sense, obviously joined by Mark, who was key early on to embracing the local policing consultation from the board and develop a plan to bring that to life. The first tangible effect of that was the uplift in neighbourhood offices um, to just shy of, of 800. Uh, then the baton passes to Alan, who has tried to settle things down, ensure, for example, that we've got an office of award, that we're working seven days a week uh, on broadly a, a 16 out of 24 shift pattern, and that we're supporting that with an emphasis on problem solving and crime prevention and linking that to training. Clearly, there's been a big push around visibility, both footbeat, bike patrol, to bring that sort of officer on the beat type feel to things. And the next phase, um, I think, will link in directly with your question around sort of evidencing sort of the return on investment and giving a framework as well for both internally and externally people to make judgments. So 
whilst Alan has started the, the work off, Bobby will now be looking at how we bring to life what I've described as hallmarks for neighbourhood policing. There'll be six, sorry, eight sort of strands to some defined standards that you will give a local district commander or an area coordinator to say, this is what this should look like. So whether it's in the, the sphere of visibility, accountability, and so on and so forth, that's in its end stages. And clearly, when we've got a fully formed document, it's something we can share with the relevant committee to give a direction of travel. There's intentions to support that, which is an internal document with a public facing commitment as well as service standards. So that as a member of the public going forwards, whether you're picking the phone up or reporting a crime, there's more clarity what you can expect from us as an organisation, notwithstanding the situation we find ourselves in. So Bobby has been given till April to sort of bring some of this to life. It was nearly finished uh, as it was. And I think that will be the next iteration of how we can evidence we're using these people wisely and productively to protect communities and actually to hit those three challenges that have set the organisation about being visible, accessible and responsive. Chief Constable, thanks very much for that comprehensive response. I suppose we, this is something I think we will revisit and perhaps two or three months is the, is the timeline. Uh, I just wondered as well as you know what you've outlined in your answer, whether you felt there were any sort of obvious gaps in the arrangements at the minute, areas how we maybe share best practice or, or, or uh, best practice models, uh, even within the, the PSNI or indeed within the, the districts that you might share with us? Yeah, and, and again, I think the thirst for knowledge and, and innovation is something we're really trying to encourage. Um, I, I could point to personal things I've seen across the country where there's been some standout work in the neighbourhood space. Um, time will probably inhibit some of that today. Um, but I think in terms of, we're keen through Will as well, so some of the work he's doing, developing firstly things we'd say is communities of interest, therefore practitioners sharing their own very granular experience about how you do. Then that's supporting with what works evidence, both using our, our own frameworks, but also linking more into the UK College of Policing, where there is a what's work element to their website. Um, and also linking it to professionalisation, if I can use that word. So. There'll be often models of, if, for example, in, in the portfolio that Mark leads in terms of a detective about levels of accreditation and professional practice. So the challenge we're looking at is why don't you create the same route map for a neighbourhood officer? So we're looking at establishing a neighbourhood faculty within the policing college and using that as where you get sort of inducted into the role of a neighbourhood officer and then a, a pipeline of professional development over the course of your career either as an officer or a first-line supervisor to help you with the elements of problem-solving, prevention and policing your community. So that, again, will be things that we can report on further and you'll see in the months ahead. Thank you very much. Chief Constable. Thank you. And leading on from that, John, a question on neighbourhood policing. Thank you, Chair, and thank the uh, Chief and the senior team for the reports before us today and the information we've received. Question um, I want to ask relates to the recent publicity around the um, freeze in recruitment and the um, postponement of the intake of student officers. Um, we're, we're learning more as this evolves, and I think we know now that the recruitment freeze by itself will not necessarily address the issue of the funding gap. But Chief Constable, your report today, um, as well as highlighting the seriousness of the situation, also points out how the Department of Justice budget has been disproportionately impacted by budgetary proposals. So in light of that, can I ask uh, how this re recruitment postponement is likely to impact um, allocation or filling of posts in the short to medium term yeah. and how that will increase in impact if there are further postponements of uh, intake? Yeah, thank you. Well, I suppose it gets to the heart of my opening comments, John, in relation to you know, the, the, the general sort of theme of one officer less a day, if this is not addressed, I know that's not literal, but um, Pamela and Mark run a monthly resourcing meeting where we do prioritise against risk and harm, the prioritisation of posts, because regardless of the situation we find ourselves in, we're, we're constantly in churn because of promotions, retirements, etc. So we will have to begin a set of prioritisation as to where vacancies are allowed to fall or, or indeed recoup to the centre. I think it's also important to stress that um, whilst the numbers may be dramatically down on our plan, we, we were not freezing recruitment. Still, the proposal is small intakes across the year. 
as I know Mark from his previous experience in other times is passionate as is Pamela about keeping that lifeblood going because the effects of closing recruitment processes are just so hard to recover from so that um, I, I think both are, 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 are valid points to make but we're trying to sort of ameliorate that I think by the end of the year inevitably we will have to start to set our new budget clearly there's some uncertainty even with events of today about where all that may end up but we will have to continue the scenario planning that Pamela and Mark have begun and come back to the board once we've got clarity about where we assess even in year one that reductions in office and numbers are most likely to be seen and where we're going to have to adjust how we place crime and antisocial behavior and so on and so forth thank you for that um jerry your question regarding ombudsman Curry, and uh, thank you to the chief counsel for his report i want to bring it to the the recent ombudsman's report which was into the northwest uh, uda and a number of murders between uh, 1989 and 1993 as you know, in the report, it says that in 2016, the senior investigating officer um, had of the investigation sent the report, which involved uh, a connection to an individual and uh, of several murders and attempted murders and a number of evidential links uh, to that. And uh, that the office, the Ombudsman's office has been on since then asking for an update. Could you give us an update in terms of the status of the investigation and particularly you know, um, since it is six years ago and there were evidential links to an individual around a number of murders, um, has has it has it commenced? Has anyone been arrested? Has this individual been questioned and arrested? And uh, have the families of those involved um, been kept up to date? Yeah, thanks, Joe. It's probably easier to pass this to Mark to answer because I know he's personally been quite involved in the consequences of the report, but also the events that led up to it. So I'll pass it over to Mark. Yes, because this was handed to me in my time as in, in legacy. So um, it was part of the case. It was put into the case sequencing model along with all our other um, inquiries. Uh, inquiries started last April. An arrest was made um, in January of, of the named individual and the family related. To the, 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 the arrest in respect of, of one of the murders and the family have been spoken to and informed of that. Jerry, yes. And I suppose is that progressing to is that it finished is it progressing has well that's the main the main evidential opportunity and i don't want to talk too much more in the public session on this um we believe has been has been followed up but i wouldn't want to say any more about that it's, it is a live matter and i wouldn't want to say more about it just in the public session sure. except that it is a live matter and you're continuing the investigation yeah it's a live matter and will be subject i mean there has been arrest made and the investigation is ongoing around that arrest okay thank you uh, and back online, Dolores had uh, had follow-ups on that as well. Dolores. Oh, well, Chair, given that it is a live investigation, can I ask uh, then the principal off, if, if there are uh, evidential links passed to the police that warrant uh, investigation, why would the uh, PSNI then not take those as they come in, as opposed to any chronological order, given that they could lead to arrests for some of the most horrendous um, sectarian murders? Uh, well, I mean, it's a fair question, Dolores. Uh, the decision was made in my time. It was assessed against a case sequencing model and pended against specific, the specific uh, murders. We don't, obviously, the, the, the Ombudsman has grouped her cases in a different way to us. We go through them case by case. And, you know, to be honest, there are a number of ways that, that people have access into the process. For a number of times, we will set the case sequence model aside for, for example, um, directions from the DPP. A number of cases have been directed on that. But the, side, the time the recommendation was made that we should just pen this until it arose in the case sequencing model, and that's what happened um, for that piece of evidence. Um, and I suppose it's, it's reflective of the scale and volume of the number of things that we have. Uh, in the in the legacy arena, um, but that's that's what happened, and um, that's that, that, that people rightly are subject to criticism one way or the other. That was a decision that we took in twenty sixteen. Uh, Chair, can I ask, is that decision now going to be reviewed? Given that I think many people accept that there aren't going to be many prosecutions, but where there are, is new evidence produced, that that should be prioritised, and and that principle then uh, in terms of urgent investigations outside of sequence of models should now be the norm? And are there any other such cases 
Plus, uh, can I ask in relation to um, the RUC's decision at the time in relation to members of the UDR who were passing information to uh, loyalist murder gangs, whether or not uh, those were investigated by the military police? And if so, given the failures of the military police in the past across a number of investigations, will those cases now be looked at and investigated by the PSNI? So the case sequencing model remains extant, so it still assesses each piece of information that comes in and assesses, we assess them when a case comes forward. So at the minute, there's no plans to change the case sequencing model. Um, and there's been a lot of conversations about that since we introduced it a number of years ago. And before that, uh, it was a, a sequential chronological model from uh, from the HET day. So at the minute, you know, we're still following that model. Uh, and at times, then we prioritise cases according to other pieces of information that's come along. So there are cases that that, that that times we will then take out of out of sequence, and sometimes we get criticised for that as well. In terms of the military stuff, uh, Dolores, um, uh, again, if, as each case comes up uh, for review, then obviously these matters are being are, are considered. Um, clearly, the ombudsman has pointed out that some of these matters were passed back to the military police. Um, that's not currently within our are under you know, our, our um, purview. Uh, we don't know what happened with, the, with those pieces of information. We know that some soldiers were arrested by the RUC at the time, um, but obviously all these factors have to factor into any review of, of a murder as it, as, it, as it comes along. Sorry, Chair, to come back, but given that there are a number of uh, pending pony reports, where I suspect aren't going to make good reading uh, for the RUC uh, in terms of policing in the past, and, and I do accept the difficulties that it is for the PSNI in terms of public confidence, I would ask that there is a review and where, where there is new evidence uh, to give uh, bolster confidence, particularly those who have been most affected by the heinous crimes. But also, uh, uh, I, I would want to speak further, I think, and, and hear more about those cases in terms of UDR um, officers who did uh, leak information and provide intelligence to loyalist murder gangs. So, I don't. I don't think we've got a satisfactory uh, response here, and certainly not one uh, that I would support. Well, I'm, I'm happy to talk to the board again about the case sequencing model and the process that we use to prioritise cases. Um, certainly, if it's an evidential opportunity, then it should be exploited alongside the other opportunities around the case as part of the overall assessment of the case, um, and that applies to all the cases of the troubles. Um, so. I mean, I appreciate that you don't that you're not satisfied with the answer, Dolores. But that is the process we've been following now for a number of years. Um, it's not without critique from a number of quarters. We accept that, um, but it is there to try and manage the volume of pressures that we have from all sides of the community around all of these cases. And I do appreciate, however, for this board that cases that involve the actions of police officers, either uh, former police officers or, or whatever, or for or serving police officers, have a, have an additional interest. I accept that, and um, we're trying to balance all that against against the volume of cases that we have. But I'm very happy to talk to the board again about this uh, through your legacy branch. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Just on, on what you said, uh, Deputy Chief Counsel, if I pick this up right, in, in the Ombudsman's uh, recommendation said that there were a number of, uh, of evidential links, but you seem to be saying again and again, it's in the singular. So is it a number of evidential links? Is that accepted? I'd rather not comment just in the public session, Jerry, because I don't want to misquote myself either. But my understanding is we have discharged the evidential link. Um, my understanding, yes, but please, uh, I, I would, would not want to be mis misquote or mislead the board, and I would need to come back to you to confirm that. And I don't, I would, so that's as much as I can say. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Move on to area of arrest and charge rates, and uh, Edgar has a question. Thanks, Chief Constable. Uh, <clears throat> the board has received your written uh, response in respect of the information published in the detail on the differential arrest and charge rates for Protestant and Catholics over a five-year period. A similar differential has been reported in respect of the deployment of spit and bite guards. Your response, however, noted that the largest group of those arrested uh, or charged were classified as other I appreciate that it's a voluntary choice of the individual to provide uh, information on community background. So arguably then determining um, where possible the community background of the other group would seem to be very important in assessing whether the data potentially indicate 
uh, indirect discrimination. What steps have the PSNI taken to explore the community background of those classified as other, for example, through secondary sources, or indeed to understand why differences in arrest and charge rates are being experienced? Yeah, thank a very um, important question around fair use of powers, uh, which we take really seriously. I think there's a few sort of strands to this which we can develop uh, conscious of time. Firstly, we have um, a central governance process, the Policing Powers Delivery Group, which at the moment John chairs, which looks at our use of powers in a variety of settings, and you, you mentioned a couple here. It is a difficult issue because of both legislative constraints um, and, and some of the consequence of, of, of getting this wrong in terms of understanding fully about who and how we're applying our powers to. Um, clearly, um, you, you will see there are some potential answers and we have already engaged with the Department of Justice, for example, in relation to legislation for the use of stop search powers to require people to provide more information. Um, and the other issue here is uh, about how we, on a daily basis, assure ourselves that the checks and balances are there so that each officer has to satisfy the custody officer that the requirement for arrest and detention is made. So there's one level of assurance there. In the COVID environment, for the work Alan's been doing, there's been a further check on the necessity for arrest. Uh, and then the patterns are reviewed by John in the Police and Powers Delivery Group. Uh, what we want to see going forwards, though, is where we can get better insight to try and deal with the almost it seems like a Donald Rumsfeld type conundrum of what does other mean and how do we get into that pot? Because the headlines can look stark, but clearly the, the size of the other pot is so big that it could provide an answer to the exam question that are we arresting more people from a Protestant background or Catholic background or whichever way it is, as well as recognizing other elements of diversity. So we are planning to see if there's any academic learning we can bring to this. But I think the other thing that I'm keen to have Chris Todd look at when he comes into post is more lay involvement in local scrutiny of the police use of powers to see if there's that process will bring more of a sort of a laser light -like focus on what's happening across the country to see that what we're doing is absolutely fair, justified and proportionate. We can probably report back on that in a few months. And have you looked at any secondary sources in terms of trying to understand the other group? Because I agree, it's because of the scale of it, actually, it's bigger than, than, than the, the, the two religious groups. Uh, it could be very significant in terms of the balance. And if you look at census data going back, you, you find a great proportion of other tend to fall into the community background of Protestant. Uh, if you look at the school data as well, similar sort of issue there. So I think it is quite significant. Yeah, we are looking at a range of options, but also it's, it's, a, it's a sensitive issue. And, and uh, this is the thing we've debated quite a few times about the rigours of, of, of that approach. Clearly, we're only discussing this morning, Mark and I, about the census data being on the horizon. And does that provide a different perspective on what the sort of makeup of Northern Ireland looks like? But I think it's probably safer to say that if you can, through the chair, to let Chris settle in and have a look at this in the round and bring some further conclusions back in the months ahead, because he will have a lot of experience from how the issue of um, use of police powers, for example, on the black community in West Midlands are, you, are, are applied, which is similarly difficult and contentious. And probably we want to ask him to bring that experience here to see if there's any learning we can share. Thank you. Uh, on to issue of uh, domestic abuse and indeed police morale. And uh, Joanne has questions in this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chief Constable. Um, first, I would like to put on record as this board's trustee in the RUC GC Foundation, um, given some earlier comments, I think it's vitally important that we put on the record that the RUC was a worldwide exemplar on many issues. Um, I'd also like us to remember that the bulk of people who were killed in the Troubles were killed by the IRA, and that the only avenue that those people have for justice is through the case sequencing model. And I think it's important that this board remembers it. Uh, Chief Constable, um, my questions are twofold, and the first one is less of a question with regard to scrutiny, but more one of public service and public interest around domestic abuse. Um, your report contains considerable information about domestic abuse, new legislation, and the cost of its implementation. But without question, that crime is significantly underreported, worryingly so. 
um, presumably, I imagine, because of the fear of consequences for what happens when it's reported and what happens when the police leave. So for the sake of those listening, um, and to reassure them and, and encourage them about coming forward, would you please outline to us the options to report and what the steps are whenever somebody reports a domestic abuse incident, please? Yeah, well, absolutely. I think firstly, it's about re-emphasising what you say, Joanne. This is, if you look in the round of the crime issues that we have to face uh, on a daily basis, it makes up a fifth of the reported crime too. So this is, is a significant issue. Uh, for people that are watching, want to go into the report, which will be made available, you'll see both in the short term, the uprise in reported incidents um, over the Christmas period, as well as some of the legislative changes. But I think in terms of assurance, Firstly, I think absolutely, uh, if you are being assaulted uh, and an immediate threat to your life, it's about treble nine or someone close to you doing that. Um, there are obviously in non-urgent cases, the 101 service, uh, there was third party reporting through various sort of support groups in terms of advocacy. And there's, the, there's new phone systems as well, which we can provide some details on about how you can report silently when you, you're in a difficult situation. I think the thing to emphasize is that from our point of view, we take every incident and crime really seriously. There is an incursion and a presumption where evidence exists about arrest, increasing use of body worn video to support decisions around charge. And we've seen over the last 12, 18 months with the work that um, Anthony McNally is doing and indeed his predecessors, a gradual improvement. I've talked more than once about domestic violence with injury being one of the few crimes where we can say who's done it. And so that when we're in that space, really challenging sort of arrest and prosecution decisions to give victims the confidence that they can expect us to, to, to provide a sanction to a perpetrator. I think the other thing it's worth stressing, though, is that we clearly recognise this is a complex issue. Uh, often the person that's at jeopardy of arrest and then imprisonment uh, is also the breadwinner. So that there are short term sort of risks and then longer term consequences. And this is where you, we've talked a few times about the work that Anthony's doing in the space of the male violence against women and girls strategy and plan, which will be coming to the public space in a few weeks, about really careful consultation with a wide range of stakeholders and advocacy groups to see where we can get our messaging really clear, the nuance in the support right, and actually you'll see data in the report as well, apart from legislation, the advocacy service, because what we do see often in this case is that quite rightly, People ring 999, there's a police response and arrest and charge, then it's keeping people sort of in the system and supporting them until the case gets to court, which we also realise at times takes too long for various well rehearsed reasons. So there's, there's a lot here uh, and we can obviously advise committees in due course about the detail of the refresh plan that Anthony's developing with others and commitments to the public because this will remain a key priority regardless of the the budgetary situation we find ourselves in because it's just there is no excuse for this crime thank you chairman thank you chief constable and i presume that there are also mechanisms by which people can report discreetly um and that you will take discreet action in that regard just to reassure some people um chief constable my second question relates to morale within the organization um the values are we care we listen we act and i'm sure that you would agree that it's important that those values are also reflected and felt within the organization and we've heard today about new laptops and new uniforms and those are all nice and shiny but morale remains low um, you've indicated today about the stark position of the budget and the impact that that will have so the likelihood is since people will be asked to do more with less that the, the position will worsen on that basis would you please uh, give us some information around what is being done to address the low morale within the organization particularly among long serving officers. And more than that, what is being done to improve the support services they receive, which do not appear to be meeting the standard? Okay, uh, again, hugely important because obviously m m morale will link to both motivation, behaviours and actually well-being. So th th there's a whole continuum here, isn't there? Um, I know, for example, uh, we've had only this afternoon, we have a meeting with the uh, staff associations to sort of give a read out from the board, the budgetary situation. But we've got the strands of the people strategy, the five elements, which we see as sort of 
landing zones for an awful lot of work in the years ahead in relation to both how we bring people in, gaps in professional development, particularly, for example, for first-line supervisors, which have a crucial effect on the morale of a team that they lead. So have we been doing historically all that we can to equip them with the right skills uh, about how we sort of develop this notion of employee voice um, so that in a structured way, when people have concerns, there's mechanisms of feeding up. And when I was talking about this, Joanne, I'm not necessarily focusing just on a, like a whistleblower type thing, which Mark might pick on later in, in other questions. But how, how do you get the best out of the people that work for us? But how do you give them a real stake in the future? So Will can probably give you an update on the five strands to the people strategy and what we're doing. Clearly, there are, there are federation and superintendents association surveys that we'll take heed of. And actually, there's an awful lot of work that Pamela is doing, which I'll bring in in a minute, to see how we align support services to the front line to make sure that they are well-trained, well-equipped, well-briefed, and able to do their job to the best of their abilities. So that it is about one team and one system and endeavor. Obviously, when you look back on the year we've been through, there's been notorious events. There's been, we go just up to a year ago now, we had officers injured in disorder. We ask an awful lot of our frontline colleagues who re you know, remain really resilient in terms of how we respond to trouble nine calls, how we investigate crime and so on and so forth. And we know there's a real live issue at the moment, for example, around shift patterns. There's been some temporary work done in the, in the sort of light of the threat of Omicron to adjust shift patterns into and beyond Christmas because of medical advice about the likely effects on the workforce. At one point, we were losing 20% more people per day. And if that wasn't arrested, if excused the pun, we would be in a pretty dire situation. We're now coming out of that phase, but um, I am asking so between Will and um, Bobby Singleton to look at the notion of shift patterns for frontline um, officers to see if we can strike the balance right. I think the other thing to push into Will or Pamela politely is the work we're doing on occupational health and wellbeing. We've seen some improvements around timeliness, health support for people in mental health crisis, etc. But the, the panoply of things that we have to address and should be doing it is broad. But perhaps if, if you can chair, obviously the people strategies in front of you today, but Will could touch very quickly on the themes and then Pamela might want to say something about the broader endeavour of support services towards the front line. Thanks, Chief. And, and Joanne, yes, I suppose that was our, the Chief already alluded to our, our relaunch of the People Plan this week um, in terms of our bite size. And that was really an endeavour for us to let all of the organisation know what our commitment was and what our ambition was in terms of people and the human endeavour that, that our staff require. I suppose one of the key things coming out of that is that over the next month, we will be going out to staff to ask them actually under the five principles, what does good look like for them? So it's great for me to sit in a room or some of my senior colleagues to sit in a room and, and ask that question and navel gaze, but actually we really need the voice of, of staff to tell us what does that look like, but more importantly, what would success look like? So we do intend to go out and ask them those questions and actually what do we need to do over the next three years of the people plan for us then to get, I suppose, an informed and lived experience action plan coming out of that under the five key principles. Just pick up a few points. Joanne, you're quite right. And I think Will is also referring to those five principles, which is the sort of windmill, windmill effect uh, diagram, is that we will be undertaking pulse surveys across each of those five areas throughout the course of the year. And I think that in addition to the work that we will undertake in the cultural audit, will give us an, an element of an evidential base around morale and how, how the workforce are actually feeling. Uh, and moreover, what can we do to improve that for them? You made a comment at the start around the budgetary pressures and do more with less. And, 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 and you know what, we need to be we need to be mindful of that. And I am very much focused on that. Um, our whole workforce are extremely busy, pretty much all of the time. Um, and we have to recognize that if we have a reduction in our headcount, there has to be an impact on the service delivery that, that is going with it. We can't ask people to effectively do twice the jobs as we go forward. And I think we have to understand the impact of that on the workforce um, and be more mindful around the well-being um, as we go forward. We'll touched on, you know, we've been looking at Stronger Together, um, you know, looking at each of the support mechanisms and interest groups in the organisation and how we can actually bring all that together to support the whole workforce. Um, but we're also looking at that from within the college, how we can do that and, and mentoring and coaching within there as well. 
We have invested heavily through Oc Health and the mental health and physio and so forth uh, over recent years. Um, but that is something that we're we're very focused on ensuring that we've got those supports in addition to peer support and elements of well-being that we're we engage both with um, trade union sides on to make sure that we're we're responding to them. Thank you for that. Um, related issues, question, two questions now online. Firstly, from Linda Dillon uh, on the Sinead McGrotty case, and then one from uh, Deidre Toner in relation to update on violence against women and girls strategy. So Linda first. Thank you, Chair. Can I just check that you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, Chair, just my question is not specifically around the case because I understand that there are ongoing issues and, and I don't want to do anything that would interfere with that. However, I would like an update from the Chief Constable, particularly around, you know, in relation to conversations and questions that have been pre previously been asked there around, you know, well-being and morale and how staff feel. And, and we talked about misogyny and questions have been asked around that. And the Chief Constable has addressed some of that stuff. But give us an update on what is happening in relation to the Chief Constable going back to this young woman, because we did ask the question and we talked to this um, back in, I think it was October um, or November. And we were told at that time that the Chief Constable would be going back to Sinead within a matter of weeks. So I would appreciate an update. I think that if we really seriously want to tackle violence against women and girls, then the starting point is tackling it within the organisation and, and organisations, public sector organisations right across the board. And all of us have a responsibility within our own organisations to do that. But I think it's important that the PSNA take that on as a starting point that if, if it is not addressed within the organisation, and that of course will have an impact on morale. It will have an impact on you know new officers that have come out of Garneville, maybe coming out with very good training and learning bad habits from those who, who are in the service have been perhaps in for a long time and are not maybe quite as good in terms of their approach to, to this issue, particularly around misogyny and around violence against women and girls. Yeah, thank you, uh, Linda. I think the first thing, it's a bit in the same theme as Joanne's question. It's about signaling a message through here that our determination to root out wrongdoing in this space. There is no place in the police service in Northern Ireland for people that want to abuse the power that comes with their, their position of office, whether it's a constable or indeed a member of police staff, and nor indeed is there any place for predatory sexual behaviour. And Mark is doing a lot of work at the moment in relation to review of uh, previous cases to see if there's any uh, evidential opportunities missed if the decision making is balanced and proportionate and we put additional resources into the whole misconduct arena uh, to, to give that matter due priority. Clearly this is goes to the heart of other stuff that Pamela's touching on in terms of this is about tone which will come from us, our own behaviours, as well as how that is then modelled right across the organisation and the lessons may be to be learned from the cultural audit which we can anticipate um, in a few months time. In relation to the specific case that you mentioned, it wouldn't be appropriate in a public meeting to go into detail. Suffice to say, we've continued dialogue with the individual through third parties, through my office. Um, the recovery of information in relation to this case has been increasingly complex. Um, I am as determined as anybody to get to the heart of this and give meaningful answers to Sinead when we've got a clear position on her concerns and just what has led her to the situation she finds herself in. So we are working, only yesterday I was spent, spent most of the day reviewing some of the findings that we've got hitherto and we are determined to get to the bottom of this but it is taking longer than we'd anticipated. But that's probably a briefing outside of the public session chair but if you want it may be a, a, a timely moment to ask Mark and Pamela just to give a few sort of headlines about what we're doing in this space, because I know it's a, a matter of concern to members, both in the response to violence against women and girls, which Bobby's leading on, as well as conduct and culture. Oh, yes, we can have that. Can we perhaps just take Deidre's uh, uh, question first, and then you can you can respond to that. So Deidre. Thank you, Chief Constable and team, and, and, and thank you, Chair. Um, it, it's, it's not unrelated to, to Linda's. It's more around the tools that are used to actually create a strategy. Uh, for violence against women and girls. We've got the Professional Standards and Conduct, 
with a report and work on that. We've got the people strategy and the cultural audit. To me, they're all linked together to be able to produce a strategy against violence against women and girls and dealing with misogyny. And considering the, the increase in sexual misconduct in the workplace, not just within police forces, but a, across all different organisations, I think there is a time element to this. So you've stated that the strategy against uh, vi violence against women and girls is coming out to public consultation in the next couple of weeks. If I've picked that up incorrectly, please correct me. But also you're talking about months ahead for the other reports. So how do you align uh, a strategy uh, you know, that is going to make sense without the, those tools in terms of the other reports feeding into that and acting as measures and impact um, measurement uh, across will this thing, will, will it work and is it addressing the right areas? And considering there's other areas in terms of the UK government and the College of um, uh, Policing have frameworks and national action plans that are already in place, it's not starting from, you know, nil, it's, there's, there's a lot of work out there. Yeah, th thank you, David. Well, you're absolutely right. So probably if I begin by just bringing Bobby in to talk about the work on male violence against women and girls, because I know he's been heavily engaged in the detail of that with uh, Anthony McNally. But you, the, the points you make are very fair in the sense that there is already across the UK national frameworks, so that some of what we're doing is about following, for example, the National Police Chiefs Council agreed strategy, which has come out and is the sort of umbrella from a, a, a positional point of view that we're using so that we don't reinvent the wheel. We are patched into the, the national work that uh, a, a deputy chief constable called Maggie Blythe is doing from the Home Office, uh, as well as our own endeavors. A lot of this that you're talking about here, I think when you try and summarize it, is about insight. So both internally and externally, how do we root our strategy on sound evidence and prudent decision-making so that the consultation has been going on over the last few months through work that Antti and the team have been doing with the intention to produce something so that, that that's nearly its end phase. But if we can, Chair, perhaps to bring Bobby in for some detail. Yeah, and thanks to Deirdre and Linda for their questions. Um, so I'm pleased to be able to report that the work on the development of our strategy and action plan is well advanced. Uh, we've spent most of the last month, in fact, addressing the issues which Deirdre refers to in terms of ensuring proper organisational alignment and coordination. The next step for us this month is going to be about returning to external consultation, revisiting some of the groups that uh, participated in our September uh, 21 listening event, and again, taking their views on, on the strategy, which again, Deirdre, you'll be happy to hear does exist, uh, is now in a draft format and is approaching finalisation. In terms of next steps beyond the consultation phase, we're confident that we can have that with internal governance at the start of March. Um, and we're aiming to have the finalised document for publication either at the end of March or at the start of April. But of course, in this space, um, our work continues daily. We're not waiting for the strategy and action plan in order to address this vitally important issue. And members will have seen from the Chief's report this month that in December alone, there was significant activity in particular focused on the area of safety uh, in public spaces. And of course, our work on domestic abuse also continues. It's been raised by Joanne today, and there are significant efforts to ensure that we're doing everything we can there to support victims and also to address the issue of repeat offending as well. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to continue with uh, questions online. Uh, coming to uh, Morris Bradley next, uh, uh, and then back in house to Trevor. So, Morris. Yeah, Chair, can you hear me? Yes, yep. loud and clear. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to the Chief Constable for appearing today. Uh, Chief Constable, following an, an editorial which appeared in the Sunday Times in January 23, 2022, former ACC Alan McQuillian makes several allegations centered around the Assets Recovery Agency, of which he was Assistant Director at the time. Mr. McQuillian makes the serious allegations that the Assets Recovery Agency had been directed by the government to target loyalists rather than the ARA. He also claims that the ARA were blocked from investigating the multi-million pound smuggling empire controlled by the South Arma IRA. Further allegations that senior Sinn Féin figures persuaded Tony Blair, the then Prime Minister, to prevent the ARA from probing the financial affairs of top Republicans in South Arma to maintain their support for the peace processes. These are serious allegations. 
and extremely worrying, especially with low confidence in the PSNI in some unionist areas and amongst the PUL community. Giving a, a, a perception of two-tier policing in Northern Ireland, can I receive an undertaking from the Chief Constable that he will fully investigate the allegations from such a high-ranking former officer into the way the Assets Recovery Agency worked historically and how they are working currently to bring criminals to justice? Uh, also, the allegation that the senior Sinn Féin officers and the Prime Minister who colluded to thwart the proper investigations into crime, criminality and paramilitarism. Thank you, Morris. Um, well, clearly, these are the, 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 the tone of what you're saying represent very serious allegations that would, if you took it to its end degree, would go to the heart of previous government. So I think it's best that rather than rush into a, a sort of partially formed view today, um, we'll, we'll ask uh, Mark McEwen and the deputy to look at the tone and the detail of what you're saying and, and come back in due course with a, a more rounded answer. Yeah, yeah. well, th thanks, Chief Constable. T to follow up on Dolores' early, earlier question, uh, Chief Constable, how, how are the PSNA dealing with allegations of collusion between the Garda and the IRA murder gangs? Are officers receiving cooperation from the area's government and the Garda on these allegations of collusion? And is evidence gathering still ongoing in these allegations, or indeed, have the government instructed the old RUC and the current PSNA not to pursue these investigations? Chief Constable, this is no reflection in you or your current team of officers, but serious allegations nonetheless that need to be addressed if confidence is to be restored uh, and the organisation in all sections of our community. Yeah, again, these are very deep-seated and important issues, Maurice, aren't they? So uh, I think Mark probably wants to come in on some of um, the sort of recent past, but it's also reminding us that we have a number of sort of operational lines in this place as the legacy investigation work, uh, given the sort of tone of what you're saying, but also Operation Canova that's being led by John Boucher, which does have a brief uh, that would, would pick up some of the, the issues that you mentioned. Yeah, and that's correct, Chief Constable. Um, the most recent issues have been through Operation Canova and they've been working closely with AGS and I come back to the point that we proceed through our cases through the case sequencing model and then we, we follow the relevant, the relevant evidential opportunities and uh, and we'll collaborate with with other agencies to achieve that. Um, and that, I mean, that's that's effectively where this is, it's on a case by case basis. Thank you. Thank you. Trevor. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, Thanks, I think it was firstly, just put my um, <coughs> following on from what I did ask you questions about the terrorist investigation unit. I'll wait the next briefing on that, maybe to follow that up, but it's just in terms of that whole perception of two-tier policing. But I think whenever we get that briefing next month, that may answer some of those questions. Um, an entirely unrelated subject then, Chief, um, and I know maybe Mike had asked questions about the speeding uh, tickets, so I'm not spraying into that area. However, it's about the processing of the police and its administration systems. Mm -hmm. There was a big review of the firearms licensing a number of years ago, and it was seemed to be the panacea of all of this investment at, uh, at that time about the new system that you put in place. Um, I probably and against those who were then the firearms dealers were against that at that time. But it's interesting that the, the organization doesn't seem to have got the grips with the new system so much so that the applications are taking months and months is the first point. The second one is there's not also now a suggestion or a rumor within these organizations that you're going to suspend the system now for a couple of weeks, which makes me wonder what is wrong within the organization that it gets to such a state that you have to suspend the operation of licensing of firearms because the organization is in such a bad state. There's a suggestion you're going to introduce medicals for every application. And given that the state of the health service is at the moment, and many people in the general public who can't get uh, appointments with their GPs, how does the organization believe that it's appropriate for 10,000 people a year to go to their GP to get a medical as a requirement for a firearms licensing? And, and just to finish this off, I'll just try and do these a series of questions. Um, there's also an understanding with NI Screen. Uh, I mean, Northern Ireland has been very successful with uh, some productions in Northern Ireland by way of film. There had been an understanding in the past that those applications where firearms were used for some of those very successful films that took place in Northern Ireland, those would be turned around in six weeks. I'm told from uh, people within that the firearms, license, or sorry, the firearms, again, that those applications are now taking a year. So if that is the case, Chief Constable, you'd appreciate that there is a huge risk to Northern Ireland PLC 
in terms of the film industry for bringing some of those very successful films? And could you answer why it's taking so long to turn these around, given previous commitments from your service to turn these around in six weeks? Yeah, thank you. I mean, again, uh, firstly, um, obviously there's been a lot of scrutiny on nationally police approaches to farms licensing in recent months. Um, and, and we had invested, as you, as you know, in, in a new system that I know Alan, who's here today behind the screen, uh, had, had done a lot of work to try and speed up and automate where we could sort of routine decision making to make sure there was a balance between the length of time that applications took and a safe application of the process. Um, it is news to me about NI screen. We'll probably have to go away and look at that, as well as decisions around medicals, etc. I don't know if John immediately has any answers for you today. Uh, we won't anticipate, and this is a particular area of scrutiny. Um, if not, we'll have to take it away and give a more rounded answer. Thanks. I can give some detail. So, um, yes, you are, you are correct that there is um, a backlog, and we understand that. Um, in terms of the IT um, gap of two weeks, we are planning an upgrade um, in our IT over um, the next few months. Um, there will probably be a short delay as we migrate from one system to another. It is, uh, and, and the reason for the delay is the migration, which ultimately will have a long-term benefit. We do not anticipate it would be as long as two weeks. Um, the issue of the medicals, um, uh, it, it is a concept that is being floated as a result of the um, incident that, that happened in the southwest of England, um, as is the concept that you'll probably be aware of of social media checks. Those are things that we are aware of. Um, our early assessment of it is that um, neither of them is likely to be viable, but we do remain in conversation with the DOJ and indeed the um, industry in terms of firearm dealers and gun users. And um, we do have uh, new, newly constructed engagement sessions with dealers um, and uh, firearms groups to understand their concerns and explain the position from our point of view. Okay, can I thank for the answer, John? However, the conversation that I'm having with the dealers is that that's not the case. The relationships have never been good between yourselves and the dealers, and it's usually a case of you have made a decision and you report that to them in terms of what that decision may be. Could you answer why then, if this new system, which was been, seen to be the panacea in the past, why it has to be updated so soon? Because that, from my memory, that came at a huge investment to the PSNA at that time. So why so soon after that last investment are you having to update that system so soon? I'd, I'd have to come back to you with the specifics, but in general terms, it's really around faster and more effective um, IT. Um, as all IT systems have different versions come out required to be updated. But I can't come back to you with specifics. In terms of the engagement, these are newly constructed engagement forums um, which have been set up recognising the uh, dissatisfaction with firearms users uh, across the country. And we do very much want to have a strong relationship and a good understanding. And can, I, can I welcome that in relation to your comments around that? And I hope, I hope that does fix those relationships. And can I also welcome your comments about I think I'm taking a positive from the, the medical thing, because given that it's just like a car MOT, it's a picture of what someone's condition is that day for a car. Equally, the medical for today is a picture that would never assess their capability to carry firearms three years or three and a half years after that. So I, I welcome that. And recently on my screen, are you familiar with the application commitments previously of the head of firearms branch, not the current one, but the previous one, had made a commitment to do it in six weeks? And those applications are now taking a year. I'm not familiar with the detail around that, but I'm very happy to discuss it uh, offline. Okay, thank you. If you can come back again uh, on that one. I have two further questions notified. Next one from uh, Liz Kimmins online, and then finally Mike Nesbitt in the room. If there's anybody else, I think all questions should have been covered within private session and public, but if anybody has a burning question, they need to let me know in the meantime. But Liz, next. Thank you, Chair. Chief Constable, you had said in December that PSNA would be carrying out a review of previous misconduct investigations and intelligence relating to sexual impropriety by serving officers over the past 10 years to ensure that appropriate investigation, investigative actions were taken and a risk and mitigation plan would be applied in each case. I was just wondering if we could get an update on what's happening with that. 
Yeah, thank you. Well, we have begun that work, but probably bring Mark in to sort of give you some examples of uh, what we've put in terms of resource and pace. Yeah, so we are, we have commenced that work um, and at a future date, I'll give the board a specific update on that. Um, I think it's fair to say though to the board that the, the level of allegations of sexual misconduct have increased since the revelations in the press um, and, and the issue of the, um, the police officer murdering Sarah Everard and other cases that have come to place. So we now have 19 officers currently suspended and 25 investigations in relation to matters of sexual misconduct. Um, uh, 15 of those suspensions are in the last year. And if we compare it to 2019, when we had five people suspended for similar occasions, similar issues, we can see there's been quite a considerable increase. Um, that's clearly a very uncomfortable uh, set of statistics, um, but also I welcome the fact that more people are coming forward and I have seen in the most recent months, more people coming forward to report matters to us. And we're taking a very strong line in investigating those. And there's a number of cases for hearing coming soon. Um, the Ombudsman as well um, is heavily involved in and is, is investigating a number of these cases where they relate to on-duty conduct. So the, the review work as well, though, is will take it's going to take time because we're actually we're so busy with current cases as well. Um, I don't want to talk specifically, but I do have one case in mind which has been reviewed and has now going back to court. Um, but that review process was started some time ago. So um, we'll have to come back to the board with some more specific detail about the review. It has become time consuming. I have put an extra superintendent uh, into the uh, misconduct arena to help assess cases so that the current superintendent is free is a bit more freed up to do the work. Um, um, but it's, it's a it's an uncomfortable and difficult area of work at the minute, but one which you know I'm glad we're we're getting well into it and hopefully we'll see progress alongside that behavioural change and also hopefully reassuring the public that we are determined to root out uh, particularly sexual misconduct and misogyny in the service. Thanks Mark. Just in, in relation to the figures that you outlined there, there's 19 suspended, 25 investigations. Is it, um, would it be fair to say that you know obviously if 19 of those are, are suspended, the other six are they still in post or are they from yeah. his Sure. So with the 19 suspended, three re repos repositioned. So that's 21 officers who've had a duty adjustment in respective cases. And I have to assess each officer in terms of the, the, the um, nature of the allegation, the seriousness of the allegation, the recency of the allegation. So um, those, are, those are the statistics as planned. And some, some, some will also be wrapped into other investigations as well. So there might be a, uh, a sexual element of another investigation. Um, but it's 21 officers who are repositioned as a result of, of direct allegations. Okay, thank you. Chair, I just had one other quick question. I think it's an important one. Um, it's, it's around the WhatsApp scam text, and I think a lot of people will be aware of it at this stage. And it was just to, to try and get a wee bit of an update on that um, from the PSNI to see if there's been any successful arrests in relation to that, or um, if you've been liaising with police elsewhere in terms of how to pursue um, those who are engaged in those those scams and um, because they are very work worrying and obviously there's been some people who unfortunately have fallen victim to this as well. Yeah, I think uh, Mark McEwen's just stepping in literally behind me to sort of give an update if I can chair. Yeah thank you chair and thanks for the question. Um, I can confirm there have been no arrests in, in Northern Ireland to date. We are, we've had numerous reports um, and I'm assuming uh, the scams members referring to are the ones uh, purporting to be a family member. Um, like a lot of social media based scams, text and online, our primary route to this is prevention. And um, we've had a lot of people who have also contacted us to alert us to the fact that the scams are ongoing, um, but haven't suffered any loss because they've been educated around this. Um, we, we are connected in nationally and internationally. Um, looking at these things, um, but most of the perpetrators tend to be uh, well beyond this jurisdiction. So no, we haven't had any arrests here, but we continue um, to work to educate the community and we do encourage people to report. And so as we see new new um, scams coming forward, we can continue with that prevention work as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that. And finally, Mike. 
Thank you, Chair. A two-parter, if I may. Since the draft budget was published on the 10th of December, we've had a, I suppose, a natural or necessary focus on recruitment and the potentially devastating impact on headcount. I think it would be useful if, if the Chief Constable could address the impact, not just in terms of numbers, but loss of expertise and experience and what that means for the service. And secondly, uh, alongside budget today, we now have political uncertainty with speculation about uh, a resignation. Uh, a resignation my party would not be supportive of, by the way. But in, in terms of that, what, what's the potential impact on other service areas for the police, not least the estate? Because I was certainly expecting that during the next financial year, you will come and say, for example, we've located uh, a venue for the police college. There may not be a police board to which to pitch. Yes, well, obviously, um, we're in the shadow of wider political events, I think, this afternoon, Mike. Um, Pamela can give a broad update on the capital plan. I think it's not just about the college. We are keen to sort of develop this campus idea we've talked about a few times, and you had office crime campus and logistics centre. So we do see it as a package, albeit the college would be first. Uh, clearly, the other issue you, you, you relate to is obviously um, if we do shrink and we're losing detective experience or other specialist experience, it will put more pressure onto a smaller number of people. Um, but again, that's through the resourcing group that Mark and, and Pamela will be heavily involved on, A, in the short term, and then you sort of pass the baton to Will in the medium term when you go to one of the strands is resourcing for the future and the people strategy you've got in front of you to anticipate where there will be pressures so that even within fewer people, we can adjust where we develop and train so that we're not losing key skills and we succession plan better in some of those very niche specialisms. But do you want to give an update broadly on the capital side? Thanks, Mike. Um, actually, we engaged Department of Justice and Department of Finance yesterday uh, on our state of the estate and indeed our estate strategy that we spoke to you before Christmas on um, and, and the development of our thinking around the college and so forth. So. I absolutely agree with you from the point of view of decisions, approvals, delegations, uh, should this board not be constituted as it is, um, is something that we're continuing to engage both the chief executive and the chair on what mechanisms are there to ensure, because you're right, it is our aspiration this year that we would be developing uh, the business case and indeed the acquisition for the college and other, other, other elements around our rationalization of our estate. Okay, thank you for that. We are, just to assure everybody, looking at contingencies because nobody knows what the fallout politically uh, will be over the, not just today, but the next few months and the election. Um, but clearly it would make life much more difficult if we don't have a fully constituted board and we don't have the, the relationship that we have currently. Anyway, thank you very much uh, to Simon and all of his team for coming today to take our questions. Thank you to those who joined us online. Uh, and just to say that our next session it will be on Thursday, the 3rd of March. Um, we look forward to seeing you. Thank you all very much.